Hello from YTV, I'm Joshua Tiborowski munra and I'm sitting here with Professor Bloom. Um, Paul Bloom is the Brooks, uh, Brooks and Susan Reagan Professor of Psychology and Cognitive Science here at Yale. He teaches a class on the Cognitive Science of Pleasure and has previously taught an enormously popular introductory psychology course. Welcome, Professor Bloom, we're glad to have you here. Thank you for having me here. All right. Um, so, you're about to publish a book called Against Empathy. How would you define empathy and how in the world can you make a case against it? So, it's a good question because people mean different things by empathy. Some people mean by empathy everything good and kind and nice and I'm not against that. But there's a narrower meaning of empathy that many people have, which is putting yourself in someone else's shoes, feeling what they feel, feeling their pain. And a lot of people believe that the way to have a better world is to have more empathy. We should feel more empathy for others. And I argue in my book that that's backwards. That empathy is actually biased, it's innumerate, it's narrow-minded, and it makes the world a lot worse. So, you know, just as one example, it's because of empathy that we care so much more about a little girl stuck in a well than we do about climate change or international terrorism or anything else of a grand scale. Empathy focuses, focuses us on the one at the expense of the many. So can you think of a concrete example of policy that ha where empathy has been used to you know, promote something bad? Sure. Um, victims' rights statements. So many, many states in America uh, allow the victims of crimes to make a statement about how much they suffered. Mm -hmm. And it's very understandable. It gives them a voice. Um, and, and what they say often has an influence on the sentencing of the person who's found guilty of the crime. And, but it's horrible, because what this means is, because of how empathy works, it means that the character of the victim, is she attractive? Is she ugly? Is she light-skinned or dark-skinned? Is she articulate and smooth or awkward and hesitant? Will have an influence on whether or not people uh, give the, the, the defendant a severe punishment or a mild punishment. It feels right, but it's deeply irrational. So one alternative to being driven by emotions and empathy is the idea of effective altruism. Would you perhaps elaborate a little bit on this? I take it the idea of, alt of effective altruism is, um, I've seen this motto once, uh, combining both the head and the heart. Mm -hmm. It uses it, the heart because if you didn't have some positive motivation, some caring for other people, you wouldn't give at all. And so in my book, although I'm against uh, empathy, uh, the subtitle of the book is The Case for Rational Compassion, for caring about others. And then there's the head part, which is in, in a reasonable, rational way, you figure out where your acts can do the most good. I was once on a program like this, and, uh, and uh, there was somebody else there who was a minister. And I gave as an example uh, giving to child beggars in Africa and India, and I argued, look, you know, a lot of people have been looking at this, and when you give to child beggars, it feels good at the time, but it makes the world worse because it supports an organizations that enslave and often mutilate thousands of children. Mm -hmm. So if you really care about kids, don't give to child beggars, give your money to Oxfam or one of them, many other organizations. Right. And she was kind of shocked, and she said, I like giving to child beggars. It, it feels there, there, there's, a, there's a contact, there's a, there, there's a real connection there that I don't get by typing in something into a, a website and sending money on my credit card. And I, I'm, I'm never good at thinking on my feet, so I said, well, okay. But then later on, much later on, it occurred to me what I should have said, and my, what is my answer, which is, it depends what you want. If you want to feel a really good buzz, give to child beggars, focus on giving that makes you feel good, Give to a lot of different charities, you get buzz, 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 buzz. That's how to do it. If you want to make the world a better place, check out where your money will make the most good and direct it that way. Okay. So it seems that, you know, being driven by emotions and sometimes irrationalities can be very hard to overcome in the individual situation. Or do you think that policymakers and people in powerful positions have a special responsibility for applying cool reasoning that we've talked about? They do, because the stakes are higher. The, the stakes involve, uh, you know, if you're a bad moral decision maker, there's probably a limit to how much damage you can do. But if you're a CEO or a president or a mayor, using your gut to make decisions can end up having horrible consequences. I think a lot of cases when we end up going into irrational wars, for instance, 
are because of, um, of emotion. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's very rare that cool, collected rationality makes the world worse. Right. And I think we should aspire to have leaders, obviously who are compassionate, obviously who care about the things we care about, but who make their decisions not driven by um, pictures of dying children or pleas or fits of rage, but rather sort of a more contemplative, reasoned uh, way of balancing the costs and benefits. Right. So many students here at Yale um, aspire to do great good and also wind up in positions where they have the possibilities to do so. Do you have any advice um, to our fellow students regarding this? Um, not so much. I mean, it depends what you want. So, um, so Peter Singer advises uh, people to go become hedge fund managers and make tons and tons of money so that they can give it away. And, um, and he points out that this is much better than volunteering for the Peace Corps or something in terms of the positive effect you'll do with the world. And I think he's right. Um, but again, it depends, it depends what you want. It depends what your goals are. Um, I guess I would advise the students to keep their goals in mind and then figure out um, whether or not what they're doing is congruent with their goals. So if you <laughs> could give a personal specific piece of advice to an eight-year-old version of Paul Bloom, what would that be? Um, I would uh, take him by the shoulders, slap him on the side of the head, and just tell him, smarten the hell up. <laughs> you, you don't know, you, have, you are making so many bad choices. You are not thinking things through, um, you know, just really. Of course, he'd be stronger than me. He'd like, right, beat me up. That's um, he'd beat up his future self. <laughs> That's what um, I would do. But, but I would also tell him it gets better. My, my, my 18-year-old self was a very unhappy young man who had, had uh, and it gets better. It right. is, so I'd, right. I'd reassure him. Well, that's reassuring. That. I'd slap him on the side of the head, tell him to smarten the hell up, and then i say, but your life gets better. All right, so speaking of um, mistakes, um, what is the biggest mis mistake you think you've made in context of your field, and what did you learn of it? Particularly early in my career, I've been too quick to dismiss some work that was very different and very unconventional. Mm -hmm. And so I realized I kind of cringe a little bit on how I reacted to people who were working in, in unconventional areas. Okay. And then over time, I myself began to work in unconventional areas. And I, and I, th I, think, I've, I've, um, I think there are times where I'm too skeptical, I'm too critical, I'm too quick to say that won't work. And I've tried to, over the years, uh, fix that. So to uh, wrap things up, um, I'd like for you to perhaps supply a question that we can ask our next faculty guest here at YTV um, that you'd like that person to think of. It's related to your question you asked me about what mistakes I made. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what people believe, particularly very successful people, which mm -hmm. I, we have many on campus, um, what they've been disappointed with in academic and university life. What, 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 what has frustrated them? What has really let them down? I think if, we, if we're more upfront about that, maybe we could fix it. All right. That's a, that's a great question. Look forward to getting the answer. All right. From YTV, this has been Joshua Munrad and Professor Bloom. Um, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for having me.